Hello folks, welcome back to English 102. This is a video lecture for CRN 21940, 21971, and 21972. And this video lecture will be over <clears throat> uh, module five, which contains essay number three that was due uh, basically uh, a week from today, uh, since I'll post this <clears throat> tomorrow on March 28th. Um, so the module itself uh, looks like this in your student view. And again, with all of the essays, if you just simply follow these steps in order and follow each one, carefully and do it thoroughly, then you should be on your way to earning a good grade. Um, so we'll start with this one, uh, the essay guide, which of course contains the outline. Um, let me just sign out of Canvas here. So in the essay guide, uh, you can see here the emphasis is on recreational cannabis, as I will clarify here in a moment. And it is again due on Monday, April 4th. And the outline is exactly the same as essays one and two. In fact, all four of the essays contain this exact same outline. Um, what you will need to do is come up with three reasons in your thesis statement here. Choose any three reasons for or against of why we should or should not legalize recreational cannabis. And those three reasons, one, two, and three, will form your paragraphs three, four, and five with evidence and data supporting those reasons. Again, paragraph two, which everyone needs to have, is where you acknowledge your opponents and you refute or reject their ideas. So again, you're not technically arguing if you never acknowledge what your opposition, your opponents think or believe. So that's the first page of the essay guide. The second page is Pretty straightforward, but I need to work through some information with you to clarify. So as I said a second ago, uh, unlike uh, essay one and two, uh, everyone would be writing on the same topic, which is, should we or should we not legalize recreational cannabis throughout all 50 states? Now notice the word recreational is italicized and underlined. And I say, here right below that, that note, notice the emphasis on recreational and not medical cannabis. This emphasis is because currently only three states, Idaho, Nebraska, and South Dakota do not have some form of cannabis use laws. And to clarify that, let me show you uh, a couple of maps, if you will, that are in your Google Drive folder. So, um, as you can see here, this is uh, a map taken from the magazine Rolling Stone, which is a uh, you know music and cultural, uh, both print and online uh, publication. So all of the states here in dark green have already legalized it for recreational use. So all along the west coast. Uh, in the Southwest, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, which of course was the first, Alaska, and some states up here in the Northeast, like New York and Maine and so on. Um, legal for medical use only are these green or regular sort of green as opposed to dark green states, including Louisiana. Uh, Louisiana has a few years ago put in place an exception for a specific type of epilepsy. And if you have that particular type of epilepsy, usually in children, um, you could use uh, 
cannabis. But other than that, it is not legal in Louisiana. Um, when you have an orange state here, it says no program for legal THC, uh, meaning there are other elements or components in uh, THC, the you know active ingredient in cannabis, like uh, it's called CBD. And CBD is uh, a non-psychoactive compound that can be extracted from THC and uh, sold for, you know, uh, different kinds of issues like uh, maybe insomnia or maybe, uh, you know, uh, health ideas or, uh, you know, wellness and that kind of thing. Uh, but it's not uh, the kind of compound that gives you the high, if you will, like THC. Uh, there's another map here that is even more detail, and this uh, comes from a conglomeration of sources, uh, uh, including, again, Rolling Stone, Leafly, which is a cannabis forward publication, Politico, which is a, a solid, you know, uh, news publication, Forbes, Forbes magazine, which is a business oriented. So. Uh, I want to try to provide you guys with, you know, reliable information, as we'll talk about more in a second. But um, this breaks it down, uh, you know, state by state uh, with different categories and color coded. And the reason why I'm showing you this map is because, uh, or these maps, is because um, it is not like, say, uh, you know, the buckle your seatbelt law that no matter which state you drive in, you're required to have your seatbelt buckled when you're driving. Um, so states are allowed right now anyway to individually determine what their cannabis laws are. Um, so here, for example, in the sort of blue color it says only medical usage is legal. Uh, so you have both uh, Louisiana and Texas. Texas uh, recently uh, passed a similar kind of uh, law for medical use, but not recreational use. The recreational use here is uh, those states here that are fully legal or in green. And there are, of course, a number of states uh, here in red that uh, there is no uh, recreational use at all. And notice over here where there are states that are uh, just solid color, whether red or green or blue, or uh, hash marked here diagonally. And you'll see here that, uh, for example, Louisiana and Texas, uh, they have these diagonal hash marks, which means that it has been decriminalized, that is if you, uh, get, uh, you know, caught with it and you're not, you know, say you're not an epileptic person, um, that usage uh, is decriminalized as opposed to, uh, I'm, excuse me, I'm, I'm just saying it is criminalized as opposed to decriminalized. So uh, all of these states, like say New York, notice it has no hash marks or take these two states right here, Ohio, no diagonal hash mark, but next door in Indiana, West Virginia, and Pennsylvania, they do have a hash mark. What that means is uh, you could be charged with, depending on how much, uh, a misdemeanor or felony in those states that have these diagonal lines, uh, whereas in Ohio, uh, it's decriminalized. Uh, you might just have, say, a fine, depending on how much. So the essence of this argument again is, let me go back to the, uh, call it, uh, the guide here, is should we legalize it throughout all 50 states, uh, which would make it in effect what we call a criminal, or excuse me, a federal law. And in the United States, um, we have something called federalism. Um, and 
it is a form of government whereby power is shared at the sort of general or federal level, shared with the individual units, or in this case, states, okay? So depending on the kind of law it is, right? Uh, you know, for example, uh, technically speaking thus far, Roe versus Wade is still legal in all 50 states. It has not been overturned by the Supreme Court. So that's a federal law. Um, however, individual states have started to chip away at Roe versus Wade in terms of uh, legalized abortion. And so the same is true as I showed you with those maps of, uh, what do you call it, uh, of recreational cannabis. So um, I'm gonna break down some of these uh, more common pros and cons uh, of how to argue in a second. Um, and speaking of pros and cons, I have this note here. And if I see in your essay three that you have any sources from this procon.org website, it will tell me that you did not watch and listen to and uh, follow the instructions in this video because I say, do not, all caps underline, do not use and rely upon information in the cannabis or marijuana sections of the procon.org website. The sources they use are not reliable and are verifiable. If you do use this website in your essay number three, your essay will lose many points. So do not do this. And let me give you an example, a live example of why it's not reliable. So uh, here is the procon org website on recreational marijuana okay and they throw out a lot of information a lot of details a lot of statistics and as i said a moment ago it's not reliable they will have you know like here a bunch of information um, and so what you are required to do is to uh, like, you know, take, take this right here. Um, if you want to start at procon.org, okay, because they break it down into pros and cons. Um, that is, you know, over here in the left-hand column, yes, here are the reasons why we should legalize. And on the right-hand side here are reasons against or contrary to uh, legalizing. So let's, you know, if you, you take this right here, banking, food, real estate, construction, transportation, okay? Those are pretty specific categories. And then they have this superscript here, okay? So uh, if you click on this number three, superscript three, it'll take you to this source here, right? Because they list their sources here. Um, what I would recommend you do, folks, is if you want to use information from this site, do not, do not, do not, do not use the procon.org site, but instead go to their sources, just like you wouldn't rely on uh, or should not rely on information from Wikipedia because anyone in the world literally uh, can write information and it takes a long time for Wikipedia editors to fact check. So you should go to the references or the sources that they use to verify that information is correct. So if you, you know, or do search for this article by Lauren Dixon, which is uh, from Talent Economy, then you would find this uh, article here. Okay. Talent Economy, you can see that's the title of the article and here's the author. And so uh, what we were looking for was a collection of these categories, tourism, baking, food, real estate, banking, construction. So let's just take, uh, I don't know, one of these like uh, banking and see if it's there, okay? Mm -hmm. 
Well, banking per se, the word, as you can see down here, banking per se does not show up. Uh, that does information, it doesn't uh, conclude information about banks for cash deposits. Okay. Um, let's see, does it uh, include information about real estate? Right. There's a little bit about it right here. Okay. But, but that's it. Right, it's just providing a potential spark to the commercial real estate. That's the only time that real estate is mentioned right here, okay? And the article had said that um, transportation and all of these others, including real estate, right? Not could be, but they are a benefit, okay? So the article actually says, right, that, uh, you know, it's all conjecture. It's are likely to fill, right, uh, are likely to, uh, you know, potential spark in real estate. So that's a pretty significant difference, right? Here, the pro con is saying that it is a benefit. And the actual article, the original says, well, it could be a potential benefit. Um, as earlier, what I meant when I was saying that uh, you should not rely on uh, this website because even though it says reliable, right, that doesn't mean it really is. So, um, you know, lots of information here, but don't simply take this website at face value. You need to do your own work you're you're obligated to for your your readers right you don't want to present them with faulty misleading information okay so that's out of the way do not use the procon.org website instead use other sources and in fact i have a source for you here that's pretty reliable uh, in the past however uh, this normal.org site has been if you were on campus, it has been blocked by the Grambling server because it uh, deals with, well, marijuana. Um, so this acronym here stands for the National Organization for the Reform of Marijuana Laws. And a reform, of course, means change. Um, and this is a site that uh, includes a lot of current information as well as, as you can see, uh, you know, legal information on where things stand, uh, like here in Kentucky, medical cannabis access advances to the Senate, meaning, you know, that's just today's, what, the 27th, so that's, you know, just last week. Uh, so, you know, they're up to date on their information. Um, one of the benefits of this site is that you can kind of compare chap, um, state by state. So in this uh, link right here where it says state laws, if you click on this, you can see that state by state, you can go and figure out, okay, what are the laws in say, you know, Louisiana, right? If you click on Louisiana, I'll take you to, the Louisiana Laws and Penalties page, which you can paraphrase or quote cite from this page, right? Um, there is no author for this uh, page. Therefore, uh, you would begin here with this title of the article in quotation marks. And you can tell us the title of the article because it appears also up here in the, the tab. Um, so, Here's uh, an example. If you have 14 grams or less in Louisiana, it's a misdemeanor and there's no jail time, but you could get a fine of $100. So 14 grams is I think, what, half an ounce or something? Um, so that's, that's you know, kind of a lot to have on your person 
uh, if you're not you know, using it for medical reasons like an epileptic. Um, but notice that anything above that, uh, 14 grams right below here, 14 grams or up to two and a half pounds, uh, it's still a misdemeanor, but there's automatic jail time, right? Six months and a fine. Um, and then of course it just gets increasingly uh, severe after that. And this is just the, the category of possession. If you scroll down here and look at uh, the category of distribution or cultivation, like say, you know, you're, you have this intent to sell or you are growing it, um, any amount is an automatic five-year sentence and or 50,000, not or, but $50,000 fine. So any amount if you're distributing or growing. And notice there's this asterisk right here. And that refers to what's called a mandatory minimum. It could be more, obviously, it could be up to 30 years, which is insane. Uh, but that's one of the problems uh, with this whole issue of recreational cannabis. That is to say, on this uh, second page of the, the essay guide, I have the sort of common reasons, or common pros and cons of why we should or should not. And one of the common reasons that we should legalize is that it will provide a lower incarceration rate, often among people of color. So if there is, as I'm showing you here in states like Louisiana, a mandatory minimum of five years, then our jails are filling up pretty quickly and people's lives are being ruined, obviously. Um, if you wanted to contrast this state, Louisiana, with say a legalized state like California, just to see what the disparities and differences are for possession, you can have up to an entire ounce rather than, you know, Louisiana is just, I think, half an ounce and there's no penalty. So if you have more than an ounce, right, you can have a misdemeanor in California, uh, less than two weeks in jail and a fine. Um, and with intent to distribute any amount, right? Like you're gonna sell it, it can be up to six months. Well, that's not five years, which is what Louisiana has, right? Um, now they're, they do in California, as you get further down with larger amounts, right? Um, like say, uh, you know, if you're selling to a minor, it's a felony, you get three to five years. Um, if you're cultivating it, uh, there's no fine, but if you have more than a certain amount, more than six plants, six months, right? So it's, it's fairly lax compared to other states, right? And again, the issue is, well, why can't all 50 states have the same laws, right? Uh, which is what you should argue. Okay, so I have these color coded, you know, green for obviously like go or legalize and red for don't legalize. Um, and your task is to choose in your thesis here, which appears in the introduction, three reasons why we should or three reasons why we should not legalize. So let's say hypothetically, you wanted to say, yes, we should legalize recreational recreational cannabis, not medical. Um, and you could just say, pick, you know, three of these right here. You could say, we should legalize recreational cannabis because we will benefit from economic taxation or from taxation that's kind of redundant because taxation is economic. Um, we will benefit from lower incarceration rate, especially people of color. And there will be a reduction of organized crime because you will have, you know, legalized it and like cigarettes or alcohol, you will uh, have it overseen by the government and you will 
take away the black market because there's no longer an incentive to, you know, buy it from some shady person down the street. So you would take those three, right? And you would put them in your thesis statement, right? We should legalize because of, you know, taxation, lower incarceration rate, and for reduction of organized crime. Okay, simple enough. And then those would become, as you can see, color-coded, more fleshed out, if you will, in the main body paragraphs three, four, and five with supporting facts and details, which there's plenty of, and I've already called or put together a bunch of sources in the folder for this essay. However, before you dive into your three main points, if you are arguing that yes, we should legalize, you need to address your opponents, right? Those who disagree with you. And so that would mean you would need to take a couple of these issues over here on the opposite side and say, uh, okay, well, some people who don't want to legalize think it's a gateway drug, especially for the youth. Um, and there are medical hazards to cannabis. And you would include those up here in your paragraph two. Okay. Um, speaking of the medical hazards, what I mean by this is um, the general method by which people consume cannabis is through inhalation, is through smoking. Yes, of course, there are edibles uh, of different kinds, you know, whether it's baked goods like brownies or gummies or whatever. Uh, but if you are smoking people, or if people you are smoking, um, any kind of smoke in your lungs as a you know, human creature or animal uh, is bad for you. <laughs> we know that for a fact. In other words, what I'm saying is if you are a cannabis user or you are a vapor or you are a cigarette smoker, any, anything that you inhale smoke into your lungs, you cannot say, no, 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 that doesn't hurt my lungs uh, because we know for a fact that's like, you know, uh, a given. It's like saying, you know, the sun is hot. <laughs> it's just a fact. Um, so, uh, you know, some people want to argue that it's a gateway drug. Uh, we talked a bit about this, uh, or I don't know if you all remember, way back in the uh, what is rhetoric and uh, logical fallacies uh, video lecture um, where the argument goes for gateway drug, uh, don't let your kids smoke marijuana or don't let anyone smoke marijuana because it will lead them to, to try or experimenting with harder drugs like cocaine and heroin, okay? That may be true for some people, but it's not automatically true. And therefore, if um, you are on the side of legalizing, you can point out that the gateway drug argument is a logical fallacy. It's uh, basically a, a slippery slope argument that it will happen. Uh, no, it may happen. In some percentages of cases, it probably does happen, but you can't say it's inevitable. Uh, you could pull back a little bit and you could say, uh, you know, rejigger that argument. You could say, don't let your kids smoke cigarettes because it will uh, entice them to try something harder like cannabis. And, you know, many kids in high school, junior high even, try cigarettes and they may or may not like them, but that doesn't mean if they try cannabis, that they will automatically like cannabis. In fact, a lot of people are allergic to tobacco products, right? So that's one way to get around that argument. Um, 
And uh, you would do just the opposite if you were arguing that we should not legalize cannabis. And by the way, folks, uh, this is your argument. You get to stand up for whatever side you believe is logical and correct. Um, in other words, you're not trying to convince me and don't try to convince me because uh, I just happen to be reading and grading your argument, right? I just need to make sure whatever side you're arguing, yes or no, that it needs to be sound and logical. Um, so let's say you wanted to say, no, we should not, we should not legalize, okay? Then just like in the other example I showed you, you would take three, one, two, three of these, uh, you know, common arguments of why we should not, and you would include those in your thesis. Like we should not legalize uh, recreational cannabis because the common way it is consumed is through inhalation and smoke is bad for you. Uh, we should not because it will uh, entice the youth and corrupt them. Or three, uh, you know, it's uh, against federal or, you know, government wide national statutes or laws, which it is, as I'm going to explain. So those would go, you know, one, two, three in your thesis, and then you would then flesh each one of those three out with facts and data and evidence to support your position. However, before you moved on after your, your thesis in paragraph one, you would need to acknowledge and address a couple of arguments of your opposition, of people who disagree with you. Well, who disagrees with you? These people over here, these people who want taxation and lower incarceration rate and reduction of crime. And so what you're gonna have to say is whatever three points over here you choose, doesn't matter which ones they are or what order they're in, you're gonna to have to argue that those three outweigh these ideas over here. And uh, it's not easy uh, to, to take the con side or the negative side. Um, one of the reasons it's not easy is, is this argument right here. And uh, it's a bit of, I will acknowledge, a bit of what we call a false analogy, meaning, uh, you know, <clears throat> cannabis is not exactly like alcohol, nor are cigarettes or tobacco like alcohol. Um, but they are, in fact, that is alcohol and cigarettes, they are, in fact, drugs, right? One is nicotine, whether vaping or dipping, you know, tobacco. And another, of course, is a depressant, is alcohol. Uh, so there are drugs, but they are, in fact, legal in all 50 states. Now, once you get inside of the state, uh, that's where, again, federalism kicks in. Um, every state and every county and municipality, in fact, has its ability to uh, either legalize or not legalize, say, the sale of alcohol. For example, in Lincoln Parish, where Rustin and uh, Grambling are, you cannot buy liquor liquor like you know whiskey or rum or Hennessy at like uh, Super One or you know Walmart okay you can buy beer and wine at Walmart or grocery stores <clears throat> but you have to go to a special liquor store to buy alcohol however if you just drive about 30 or 40 miles to the east to uh, what is it, Washita Parish, where ULM is and Monroe is. In Washita Parish, you can buy at a grocery store on a Sunday afternoon, right after 12, you can buy whiskey, wine, and beer all in one stop at a grocery store. You don't have to go to a separate liquor store. They do have separate liquor stores, but um, you can also buy 
hard liquor. And that's because in the concept of federalism, every county or parish in Louisiana's case gets to determine its own laws, right? Consent from the governed. Um, okay, so in your folder, there are a, a number of uh, sources that are both for and against. So uh, they're you know pretty easy to understand. And some of these obviously are dated, but uh, there's a lot of information in here to make a compelling argument. <clears throat> so here, just a few years ago in 2017, Colorado hit a major milestone with half a billion in tax revenue. Not million, but billion, <laughs> half a billion. And so this speaks to this issue right here of taxation, right? That uh, they take the tax from the sale and distribution of cannabis, recreational cannabis, and they use it for schools, for teachers, for uh, mental health, for roads and other things, okay? And, you know, that's a good thing. It's helping everyone. Um, so she cites some statistics in here. For example, the Colorado Department of Revenue has also reported that combined medical and recreational marijuana sales in the month of May, just in the month of May, were 127 million, making this the 12th month in a row in which sales have gone over 100 million. And that was back in, again, 2017. And here we are in you know, 2022. Um, you know, you can go find the data and statistics on it. In other words, it's a pretty, uh, pretty robust industry in states that have legalized it. Okay. So this is obviously <clears throat> Deborah Bork Borkart. She's, she's for it because she's saying, you know, look, we can really generate some needed tax revenue from the legalization of recreational. Uh, there's, uh, Christopher Ingraham, um, 2016, again, a bit dated, but <clears throat> the reason I include this is because it discusses our Canadian counterparts across the border to the north. So remember that uh, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau was and remains the Prime Minister of Canada. And he lays out a couple of principles and ideas of why they are going to and have legalized recreational marijuana. He says the first one is whatever you might think or the studies seen about cannabis being less harmful than alcohol or even cigarettes, the fact is it is bad for the developing brain and we need to uh, make sure that it's harder for underage Canadians to access marijuana. And that will happen under controlled regulated regime. So <clears throat> he's actually, going back to the pros and cons here, he's actually arguing this right here. We don't want to corrupt the innocent youth. However, if we legalize it, we will do this. We will have uh, reduced organized crime where people are just buying it off the street from who knows whoever. And when it's controlled, just like currently alcohol and cigarettes, you have to show an ID and be of a certain age, you know, that's the first reason they want to, to regulate it and legalize it. And he says the other piece of it is billions of dollars flowing into the pockets of organized crime, street gangs and gun runners because of illicit marijuana trade. If we can get that out of the criminal elements and into a more regulated fashion, then we'll reduce the amount of criminal activity, right? So, <clears throat> you know, it's on the one hand, as he says here, protecting our kids, and on the other hand, it's protecting our streets. So it's you know, hard to argue with that, but uh, he's therefore Justin Trudeau in favor of legalizing recreational cannabis, which Canada did. So that's another pro or for article. Uh, there's this time piece a while back by um, <clears throat> Kevin, uh, Klein, Joe Klein here. 
And, uh, you know, this is as far back as 2009 when it was not yet legal. And he was putting forth the argument even back then that um, <clears throat> it would generate lots of money, right? Like here. <clears throat> At the same time, there's an enormous potential windfall in the taxation of marijuana. It is estimated that pot is the largest cash crop in California with annual revenues approaching 14 billion. And, that, and that's an estimate, right? A 10% pot tax. And, you know, we have a generally speaking, depending on the state you live in, it's anywhere from eight to 10% sales tax. <clears throat> Every time you buy a gallon of milk, you're charged eight to 10%, depending on the state you live in, where you're living. A 10% pot tax, <clears throat> pot tax would yield 1.4 billion in California alone, right? So again, that's that uh, economic gain argument. <clears throat> so Klein is another one another source you know, for those who would like to legalize. Um, and here's another one, uh, a bit of a you know, kind of cosmic irony here. Uh, her real name is in fact, Julie Weed. Uh, it's not a sort of made up name. It is uh, actually her name. Um, and so this piece here, is arguing for legalization uh, because uh, it's a little more current, 2020, because uh, it is a, an industry that is blooming and, and burgeoning, no, no pun intended, um, is glo going global, right? It's not just, you know, uh, the United States. I just, you know, mentioned how it's in uh, Canada as well, but countries like Colombia and Portugal are legalizing. Uh, of course, it's been legal in Amsterdam and Holland for a long time, <clears throat> right? Puerto Rico, right, has already reported there will be at least 10,000 acres of hemp cultivated for commercial purposes. Um, now, hemp, I, I need to clarify, is not uh, cannabis in the proper sense. It's from the same plant, but it uh, has an incredibly low level of THC. It's not like the stuff here that you would find at a dispensary, you know, the, the very high potency THC. Uh, <clears throat> but nonetheless, it's, you know, marijuana. And uh, there are places who want to outlaw it all together, uh, states and countries. Uh, real medical testing will increase, right? That is... Uh, one of the problems with the entire cannabis industry or the lack thereof, I should say, uh, in the federal or United States government's approach to it is that, I'm not sure you're aware, but because it's considered cannabis, what's called a schedule one drug, and I should maybe show you what that is or means, um, by the government uh, <clears throat> is classified along with other drugs like uh, you know morphine and heroin and uh, cocaine. So um, schedule one drugs uh, are um, let's see considered, you know, a narcotic. And uh, let me try to find the list here. <clears throat> Controlled Substances Act. <clears throat> That's the, there it is. Um, <clears throat> So there's a there's an act or a law that that makes this, uh, you know, illegal. So all of these, right, including opioids, <clears throat> are considered Schedule One drugs. So 
you know, whether it's oxycodone or, you know, hydrocodone or whatever kind of opiate derivative, uh, you know, uh, it's considered, you know, there's fentanyl. Uh, those are schedule one, right? You know, there's codeine, something you might get from your dentist or physician, but also hallucinogenic drugs. So if you just scroll down here, you see that cannabis, right? It contains THC and therefore, um, Uh, it is considered, right? So marijuana right there and any kind of extracts. Listed right along mescaline and peyote, which are uh, hallucinogenic, you know, drugs, you know, like acid, you know. So here, right, you just saw hallucinogenic. All of these are considered, right? a schedule one drug, high potential for abuse, right here, no currently accepted medical use, which is ironic because I think, you know, we have been seeing state by state, they are allowing, you know, for chemotherapy patients and glaucoma patients and insomnia and epilepsy and so on. However, the DEA, right, uh, still keeps the uh, cannabis on the list of schedule one drugs. And the reason I mention this is because here we are not allowed, the United States is not allowed to use taxpayer dollars to do actual legitimate research on the use and effects of cannabis because it's considered as harmful as morphine, heroin, or any kind of opioid. In other words, like, you know, we know that cocaine and heroin are bad. You wouldn't say, okay, let's do a trial study on 500 people and give them a bunch of cocaine or heroin to see what effects it has, because we know it's not going to be good. It's highly addictive. But in the same way, because again, cannabis is still listed as a Schedule One drug, uh, we're legally prohibited as, you know, a country from having any kind of like university or lab or scientists do legitimate government funded research on the effects of cannabis. However, uh, Israel, right, is doing some, which, you know, we're learning a lot about, but it's uh, taken us a long time to catch up. Um, Older customers will expand their use beyond medical use, right? Which is probably true. Uh, so, uh, yeah, and there are a lot of bills still, you know, moving in Congress. So this article here by Julie Weed uh, is in fact, you know, for the legalization because of all the potential benefits of various different facets of the cannabis industry. Now. Here are some pieces that are against uh, the legalization. The first one is also a bit dated, but uh, you can kind of see where it's coming from. So this is from the Office of National uh, Drug Center Policy. And it, this was a person, Gil Kerlikowski, that's how you pronounce his name, Kerlikowski, who was appointed by in fact, Obama. So look at the date, right? So Obama enters office in January 2009. And he is, this Karolikowski is what we call the drug czar for Obama. And he's at a conference for California police chiefs. And in this very long kind of article, <clears throat> he is adamantly against the distribution and legalization of marijuana. However, as I point out in this marked up, uh, these are my notes and whatnot, this marked up piece, he makes a lot of logical errors because he's just speaking to police and you know they're not there to fact check him. Uh, he's sort of in some ways 
speaking to the, uh, preaching to the choir, if you will. Um, here's an example of what he does. He, he goes, we're also deeply concerned about two relatively recent threats to public safety and health. So they're not really recent. Ever since there've been prescription drugs, there's always been a threat. Uh, and drugged driving. Now, that's different from drunk driving, right? Drunk driving is obviously using alcohol, but drug to driving is when you might use some kind of prescription drug, whether it's you know prescribed by your doctor or uh, cannabis, right? And so what he's doing here is he is conflating, overlapping two different things, right? Uh, you know, legitimate prescription drugs and people who might abuse those with people who might be high if they recently were smoking and driving. Um, so he doesn't really have a lot of uh, facts or the facts that he does give in here are a bit troubling, right? Um, like here when he says, 2004, 2008, the number of visits to hospital emergency departments involving non-medical use of narcotic painkillers increased 111%. And he has this footnote of where he gets that information. And it comes from here, right? Um, the Drug Abuse Warning Network. Well, think about what he's doing here to his audience. Remember, these are police chiefs he's speaking to. You know, anything that is a hundred percent or more increase is pretty severe, right? But notice it's involving non medical use of narcotic painkillers. There's really nothing to do with cannabis, right? But, uh, you know, he's going to talk here about cannabis nonetheless, <laughs> about drug driving. Uh, right, so 16% of nighttime weekend drivers tested positive for Ill, uh, uh, illicit or illicit drug. And so he's, as I say here, right, he's conflating or lumping in, uh, you know, cannabis, which may be prescribed for that user, you know, legally in say California, or uh, you know, other kinds of like opiates or other kinds of, you know, drugs that are being misused. Um, so even though this is uh, an argument against, right? So if you were uh, on this side of the fence here, sorry, on, on this side of the fence, oops, the red side here, um, and you wanted to say, oh, we should not do it, right? Uh, this is kind of what he's saying. Uh, it's, you know, it's a federal crime. As I mentioned, it's a Schedule One drug. Uh, it, you know, corrupts youth. It's addictive. Oh, speaking of which, I have this asterisk here, right? Um, so for something to be addictive, you can't just say, oh, that's addictive, right? It has to actually have properties or characteristics attached to it. So addiction needs to meet these three categories or criteria, not one or two, but all three, okay? So it's something you do habitually or over and over, and therefore it's repetitive. Uh, you know, if you just smoke marijuana one time, you're not an addict. Um, it's something you do because it drives, you drive pleasure from it, right? So someone in a casino hitting the jackpot, they get an endorphin rush, right? Uh, and of course some money, but uh, that rush becomes addictive. That uh, neural pathway becomes uh, something that they, you know, the hit of dopamine and endorphins, it feels good. So they wanna keep doing it. Um, and it also has to be damaging. So this is the tricky one. We can understand the first two pretty easy, whether it's alcohol or, uh, you know, like I said, gambling or porn or whatever, right? But is it also 
damaging. And so if someone uh, uses cannabis on, you know, let's say once a week or a couple of times a month, right? That certainly is repetitive. It's not like they're just doing it one time. And it's likely that because it's repetitive, they're doing it out of pleasure. No one's forcing them to do it. But is it also damaging to them? Now, it is true that you could do anything, you know, too much a good thing is bad, and it could be damaging, right? Which is, uh, you know, the addictive part here. So one of the complaints of we shouldn't legalize is that uh, you're unable to do actual work or school work and be productive. And if you are smoking often and enough that you are clearly doing it obviously repetitively, so you know frequency is high uh, and you're getting you know some pleasure from doing it. But if it is preventing you from doing your work or your schoolwork and you're failing or dropping out, then yeah, you could argue that it is damaging. But my point is, is you cannot automatically say uh, cannabis is addictive if you only do it once in a while. Just like if someone says, well, yes, I drink alcohol, but I'm a social drinker. You know, like, oh, I've had, you know, I went to a party and I had a glass of wine. Uh, and then, you know, next month I went to another party, had another glass of wine, right? Um, that's not addictive. So uh, Kerlikowski, though, wants us to believe that it is. Uh, another uh, piece that is a bit complicated, I need to break down for you, is this, where it says cannabis is a federal crime uh, and that there are anti-federal statutes or laws against it, which there are. <clears throat> so remember, Obama takes office in 2009 and, uh, you know, is all the way in office until you know, 2000, January 2017, actually. So here is um, his deputy attorney general. So the attorney general is the highest legal official in the state or excuse me, in the country. Uh, and the deputy would be like the assistant attorney general. Uh, but they, they work in the Department of Justice, of course, right? As does the FBI. So James Cole here writes a memo, memorandum to all United States attorneys, that is those who work in the Department of Justice. And basically what this, you know, it's only a two or three page uh, memo uh, says is, you know, look, here are all the things we have been doing. We've been preventing violence and preventing drunk driving and so on. However, from now on, 2013 on, um, we are going to, as a United States, we're going to sort of allow the states to do their own thing unless it really poses a real problem for it, right? For the, the country. Uh, so, he says here, neither the guidance herein, so there is guidance in this document, nor any state or local law provides a legal defense to a violation of federal law, which is true, right? You can't say, oh, you know, there's a federal law, but hey, uh, we have our own local or state laws that trump that. Uh, no, <laughs> right? So he's acknowledging that. And then he goes on to say, even in jurisdiction with strong and effective regulatory systems, evidence that particular conduct threatens federal priorities will subject that person or entity to federal enforcement action based on the circumstances, right? So it's not going to be automatic. They're going to look at it case by case. This memorandum is not intended to, does not, and may not be relied upon to create any rights, substantive or procedural, enforceable at law by any party in any civil matter. In other words, this isn't a kind of like <laughs> get a jail free memo. It applies prospectively to the exercise of prosecutorial discretion in future cases. In other words, 
So the prosecutor is, you know, the state who might be prosecuting someone for possession or, you know, intent to distribute cannabis. And discretion means that it's up to the individual district attorney or the judge and the state who's doing the prosecuting to look at it on a case by case basis. Okay. So in effect, this was a kind of uh, way in which Obama's administration pulled back from the uh, what began to be uh, a state by state legalization of can recreational cannabis because the first state to do so was Colorado. It voted it into legalization in 2012 and it took effect in January of 2013. So you can see here, 2013, you know, the administration has to go, okay, well, now that Colorado and other states are legalizing, we need, we need a stance on this, a position on this, okay? So this is sort of, you know, you, you could theoretically say this is on the side of, in a certain way, legalizing. However, a few years later, right, 2018, this is when Trump has taken office because he takes office in January 2017. His attorney general, Jefferson Beauregard Sessions the uh, third. This is not not the deputy attorney general, but it's the attorney general. And what he does in this fairly short one-page memo is he basically takes this memo by Cole and throws it in the waste can. Because he says here um, at the end, given the departments, that is the Department of Justice, you can see the logo here, right? So given the Department of Justice's well-established general principles, previous nationwide guidance, meaning Cole's memo, previous guidance specific to marijuana enforcement is unnecessary and is rescinded effective immediately. And you can see here that he's referring to Cole's memo, among other things. So rescinded uh, means to take back uh, or repeal in a legal sense. So under Trump, the kind of laxity, if you will, in terms of the federal government, Department of Justice, uh, saying, okay, it'll be on a case-by-case -case basis. If there's a state that has legalized recreational marijuana, you know, let the prosecutors decide on a case-by-case -case basis. Now, in 2018, uh, with this memo, it's now that all, <laughs> all that advice is now thrown out the window and we're back to, you know, maintaining a heavy hand against recreational legalization. Uh, and then, so this is clearly, uh, you know, Sessions' uh, piece here is clearly against legalizing. It's, uh, it falls under this category of it's a federal crime and there are anti-federal statutes and laws because it's a schedule one drug. The final uh, piece, and you could find more, but these are already in the folder for you, uh, is again, it's a bit dated, but this is by a medical doctor, right? As you can see here. Um, and Bernadine Healy is her name. And she, I believe she's now passed, but um, you can see from the title, Legalized Marijuana, Obama was right to say no. And he did say no to legalizing it uh, and at a federal level, because he would have gotten too much pushback from Republicans and conservatives. Uh, but she, in this piece, if you look at it pretty closely, tries to give medical reasons why we should not, uh, you know, uh, in this, uh, let me go back to here. Right, that there are medical hazards um, or that it's a gateway drug, right? Um, she tries to give these medical reasons like, um, 
Where is it? Evidence is accumulating, however, that the heavy drug use is associated with lasting damage. Well, I can tell you, regardless of what drug you use, alcohol, cigarettes, uh, vaping, uh, chewing tobacco, uh, you know, you name it, opioids, obviously, that any kind of heavy use is going to create lasting damage. So we're not really talking about generally speaking, right? When we're talking about recreational use, we're not talking about what we might call chronic users. We're talking about people who occasionally use it. But she wants to use a kind of scare tactic in this piece to scare people away, scare people away from uh, legalizing. She goes on to say, heavy marijuana users starting in the early teens, which she's talking about, MRI scans show disruptive neural development in the brain areas that influence memory, attention, and high-level decision-making areas known to develop and mature during adolescence, right? This is, again, the corruption of youth and that it's a medical, medical hazard. But again, this is for heavy marijuana users. And yes, of course, that will probably happen. Uh, notice she's not very... Uh, kind with her language, right? Academic stars are rarely potheads. Pothead has a very negative connotation. So rather than say potheads, she could have said academic stars are rarely frequent users, right? Um, another thing she argues out of a kind of fear um, is that uh, <clears throat> when pregnant women smoke, the drug gets into the fetus. Well, I mean, duh. <laughs> that would happen if you're smoking a cigar or vaping or a cigarette, right? Uh, it's not anything new. So maybe pregnant women shouldn't be smoking anything. In nursing mothers, it enters breast milk. But duh, I think most women know that, you know, that anything you eat, well, baby will have in its milk. And in the cannabis receptor-laden testicles, there's growing evidence. Notice it's not conclusive evidence, but growing evidence. So just going to throw that out there that, you know, maybe it could be from the laboratory and in humans that THC, the active drug in cannabis, that THC causes mutant sperm, which among other things can't swim right, thus impairing male fertility, at least while the male and his sperm are under the influence. Well, that's some serious, you know, like scare information there. Mutant sperm, oh my God, I don't have a mutant child, which is what she wants the reader to believe, right? So, you know, you can believe this or not believe this. She is a medical doctor, was a medical doctor. But in this entire piece, uh, this is a US News piece a while back, uh, she gives absolutely no evidence. She, I think, mentions one or two sources in passing, um, but does not actually tell us where we can find that evidence, which is, you know, what we expect. You know, National Institute on Drug Abuse, so we'd have to go track that down. Where is that, right? Uh, or in the journal of Pediatrics, okay, where exactly does it say that? Yeah. And um, yeah, so that's the last of the articles uh, that I have in the uh, folder for you. But again, you're allowed to find your own, but make sure, again, that they are legitimate. Again, do not, do not, do not use the procon.org website. And, um, you know, have fun with this uh, piece. Everyone's going to be arguing the same thing. I'm interested to see what you guys are going to come up with and why you think we should or should not. And one final thing, um, remember, you're not arguing if you say, here's some information of why we should not, and here's some information why we should, so you, the reader, decide. That's not arguing. That's just giving a report. Arguing is providing facts and data to convince and compel your argument, uh, your audience to agree with you which is why, you know, in these main body paragraphs here, you have, you know, uh, include a specific example, factor quotation, include a specific example, factor quotation, right? That you are le 
literally, you know, uh, bringing your ammunition, just like, you know, if you were in a court of law, you know, as an attorney, whether you're the prosecutor or defense, you're going to bring evidence to bear on your side, right? So uh, that's it. And uh, that is due uh, about a week from today, April 4th. Hope this information helps. Take care, folks.